Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exult in his holy name. Rejoice. You who worship the Lord, search for the Lord and for his strength continually seek him. Remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles and the rulings he has given. You children of his servant Abraham, you descendants of Jacob, his chosen ones. I told you last week I had one more sermon in this little mini series. The spiritual discipline today is celebration. And for some of us, that may not feel like, a, like something we need to be disciplined about. But if you're anything like me, you tend to move on to the next thing. Something happens and then you move on, right? Like, oh, we just, we, that, that was great. God provided. Thank you, Lord. Move on. And you don't come back to it. That's really why the spiritual discipline of celebration is something that we're talking about. In... All throughout the Old Testament, the writers of the Old Testament continue to point the children of Israel back to one thing. God did a whole bunch of things, but they keep pointing them back to Exodus. It's all littered throughout the Old Testament. It's in Psalms, it's in Proverbs, it's in Ecclesiastes, it's in all of the prophet books keep pointing back to when God did something big to remind them. And that is something that we are also called to do too. We do it every single Easter, right? We remember something. Every single time we receive communion together, we remember something big happened. And it's a part of not just something we do to remind each other of why we show up on Sunday. It's not just something we do because it's filled with all of great morals and values to make sure my children know. It's a part of a spiritual discipline to remember the greatness of God. And a part of why we have that discipline Is so that when life is trash, (laughs) y'all, see, you wait, listen, some of you, this is your first time here. We say stuff like that. Life sometimes is trash. (laughs) But when life is trash, I can remind myself that God is good. Because he brought me out of darkness, (laughs) right? Because he saved my soul because he healed me when I was sick. We don't just move past it. And it's not because he's not going to do anything else good that we can anticipate. It's just to remind me because life sometimes is trash. And so a part of our celebration is to remember, but another part of our celebration is to also, in anticipation, know something big is happening. Something big is happening. When we talk about something big is happening, but first I want you to see this picture because we're celebrating. (laughs) Unison has existed for seven years. Last year, last week, we got to transition from being a church in development to an established church. You are a fully-fledged church family. But that is just one milestone. There have been so many things. Y'all remember when we were in the gym? Some of you were with us when we were in the gym, setting up and tearing down every single week for Jesus. (laughs) 
And what I mean setting up and tearing down, if you've ever been a part of a church plant where, like, you got to set up, it's like the chairs, and you got to put them just right. And Christine was like, we got to have the chairs just like this. And we got to have them like this. Because that, when we, we were actually a part of another church plant when we first got married, and she was the chair mistress then, too. <laughs> she was the chair mistress at the gym. And there was the, the trailer that you had to unpack real quick every single Sunday. <laughs> And that one Sunday where the maintenance person didn't open the door for us, so we met outside, then made the difficult transition to the edge. And I say difficult because it was easy because we didn't have to set up, but it wasn't in the 49507 zip code. From the beginning, we have felt that the Lord has called us to reach these people here in this part of Grand Rapids, particularly the third ward. So it was challenging, even though it was God's provision, right? I think about in in that moment, I was reading in Genesis and, and Exodus when the children of Israel left the promised land because they needed to go to safety. That's kind of where we were. Not the exact same, but I felt that parallel in my soul while I was reading it. Like, okay, all right, it's okay to be out of the promised land for a minute, God. Okay, here we go. It was such good that was there. And then move into that building on Godfrey. Some of you were here with us when we were on the building on Godfrey and building that stage. That was the first time that we had had a space of our own. And it was hard, being honest. Most of us enjoyed our time of worship and fellowship. We got to do classes and different things and meetings and exercise classes. Israel was a part of an exercise class upstairs. Like... (laughs) But it was also hard because financially, we were struggling. I mean, like multiple weeks of me not getting paid struggling. And recognizing that what it is to launch a church comes with immense sacrifices. It's not just, oh, let's start a church. Yay, Jesus, we love Jesus. It is. I mean, if you've ever started anything, it doesn't matter how passionate you are about it. Doesn't matter how called you are to it. Doesn't matter how good it is. It's hard to start stuff. And God was with us. God was with us. And then we moved here. And The story of how we got here, I've told before, but the quick version of that is Hope Reformed Church was ending. I was very close friends with the pastor because before Unison even launched, I was driving through the neighborhood and felt the Holy Spirit say, you should get to know that pastor. So I said, okay. And I didn't even know him, didn't know him at all. Stopped my car in the uh, Islamic mosque down the street, (laughs) Googled the name of this church, called, set up a meeting. And by the time that Hope was closing, the pastor and I were working out together three times a week. And as they were closing and we were struggling, we were holding each other up. And he was a significant advocate for a, well, let me back up and say, while they were closing, they were praying that the Lord would bring a young multi-ethnic church to this corner. And then he became an advocate for Unison to be here. Like... And then a pandemic hits. (laughs) And that impacted all of us. And here comes the chair, mistress. This time, not just organizing chairs, but organizing house churches (laughs) so that we still have community and we still can connect with one another. God was with us. 
And then we purchase the building. And we get to bring in new family members. I actually want to, for a second, if you've, if Unison has become your home church or you've kind of become a regular attender at Unison in the last year, can you do me a favor and just like stand up? Because we want to acknowledge you. Like, this is huge. Like, we love (laughs) y'all. We love you. You can have your seats. We love you. Like, it's, unison is, it's more than just us doing this on Sunday. We have lived life together. And every single year, every single year, at the end of this day, I sit and I, before the the next year even starts, I thank God for those whom he will bring to our family whom I don't even know exist. Right? That's, it feels miraculous every time that happens. And while all of us have been a part of this story, there is a uniqueness to the chair mistress. Christine, you have been through all of this. Yeah. And... Uh, Come here. Come here. Come here. No. <laughs> hey, you pretty. <laughs> You've been through the moments of celebration and the moments where I'm staying up late trying to figure stuff out. You've prayed for and cried for unison um, in moments where, listen, reminding each other, having to remind each other that just this, this is Jesus' church. And if he want to close this thing next week, that's his prerogative. And we're going to continue to serve faithfully. And you have served our family faithfully. And I am grateful to do life and ministry with you. And so I wanted to get you. Uh, thank you, love. Thank you. Uh-huh, right. <laughs> Man, you hot. Okay, all right. So back to Jesus. No. <laughs> we have a lot to celebrate. Something else that is common is I borrow words from Paul on this Sunday. Paul has words that he says to the churches that he has planted. In Romans chapter 1, verse 8, he says this. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. That's not something that I'm like just saying because Paul said it literally. Unison is being talked about all over the place. I told you all last week at our family meeting that you're an anomaly to have a multi-ethnic urban church plant in Grand Rapids, Michigan, as a part of the Wesleyan denomination, literally, there are not, there's none of you. Like, there's, there has never been a church that's been started like us. Amen. And the reason why I say started like us, there are other multi-ethnic urban churches, yes, but there are only a few of them. One, right? Out of the 1,557, there's only eight of us that are missional churches, urban missional churches. And only two of us are now established, but only one has been planted by a black pastor. And that matters, particularly in a place like Grand Rapids, where it's difficult to engage with the philanthropic culture here if you aren't Dutch. Just being real. I'm just being real. 
Listen, if it's your first time here, this is how we get down. We, this is real. Okay? When we said that we felt like God has called us to reach the 49507 zip code, the Wesleyan Church changed their mission statement to include reach, having a presence in every zip code They changed their mission statement as a result of what God was doing in unison because there was something big happening. I need you to look around. I need you just for a second to look around. Not many churches in our area look like y'all. And that's not something that we just decided, hmm, it makes sense. Let's have a multi-ethnic church because that's easier. It's not. It's not easier. It is more challenging to have a multi-ethnic church. Because while we love seeing all the hues and the melanin and yes, that feels good to us. When we start talking about when we start talking about what we eat or what songs we worship to or whether or not we actually even have dance, because is that a thing? It's definitely a thing. Okay. Or how we raise our children. All of those things are really kind of starting to talk about culture. And those cultural differences make it difficult to be authentically family. But y'all have risen to the occasion every year. You've not just settled with being cosmetically multi-ethnic. You've engaged in racial reconciliation conversations. You've prayed for healing as it relates to race in our world. We've challenged each other. And people are talking. It's just the truth. When I borrow those words from Paul, it's not just because they sound good. You are an anomaly, and people are studying how you work. And you may not know that, and that's not something for us to be arrogant about. It's just something to, when I say the title of the sermon, something big is happening, something big is happening. The Holy Spirit is doing something in the earth, and he has called us to be a part of the first wave of that. Not that we're special, not that we are unique in that that we have something unique to give to the world other than what the Holy Spirit has already given us. And people are talking. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians, we always thank God for all you do, excuse me, all of you, and pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have said this before, that quarterly I have a time alone with God and I spend at least a half, half of that time praying for all of our church family by name. Amen. And there are times where the Holy Spirit gives me something unique to pray for somebody, but it always starts off the same, thanking God that I get to do life with you all. Not every pastor has that sentiment of get to. I get to do life and ministry with you, and I thank God for that. This last portion is a little bigger. Philippians chapter 1. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you. For you have a special place in my heart. 
You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow, overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. It's like Paul was just like writing for me. Okay, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. May the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Amen. Amen. I know those are Paul's words. I get it. There's nowhere in the world that he was thinking about you when he wrote it. There's nowhere in the world he was thinking about me when he wrote it. I get that. But know that that is, that is, that, that's, that's like finding lyrics to a song and making a mixtape for your boo. <laughs> right? That's literally, it's like, oh, every time I read that, I think about y'all. Like, that is literally the truth. Every single time I read that portion of Philippians, I see your faces. I am so glad that God has brought us together. I'm so glad that God has brought us to do ministry together. I'm glad that I get to pray for what's going on in your life. It's not, sometimes I know it feels weird because you're like, oh, I think he might be too busy every single time you text. I'm glad that I get to pray for you. That's not something that I'm making up to make you feel good. A part of what it is to do this together is that we get to do life and ministry together. And I am grateful, grateful for the opportunity to do so. Something big is happening. Um... Some of you have heard this and some of you have not. Uh, when I felt like God initially called me to plant a church, I went to Lindo, Mexico, which is a restaurant on 28th Street in Wyoming. Because clearly I needed some chalupas or something. And I was there by myself. And they have these um, salt and pepper shakers that are actually their Corona bottles that they put salt and pepper in. Um, and I was praying while I was there. Um, and I was like, God, I don't really get it. There's a whole lot of churches here. <laughs> Why do you want to plant another church. I don't get it. And then I was like, oh, multi-ethnic. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. But like, uh, that's, like, that's just not it. That can't be all of what this is. Like, it can't just be about there being a multi-ethnic church. What are you doing? Because this seems like, there's like 500 churches here, God. I've come to the place now where I am glad every time another church starts in this area. Um, and my reasoning is nobody complains when another McDonald's pops up. So, um, so I will be glad when another church pops up. But in that moment, I was trying to figure out, God, what are you doing? And then I felt like those salt shakers turned into a hill. And I saw what I call our Goliath um, kind of like come over the hill. And God started talking to me about Jesus's prayer that the church would be one. It's in John chapter 17. He starts off praying for himself in that moment. Then he starts praying for the disciples. And then he specifically starts praying for us. And by us, I mean every disciple that would follow after those original disciples. He starts praying that we would be one. And that as a result of our unity, the world will know that the Father sent him. And that the Father loves the world as much as he loves the Son. What? That the Father loves us as much as he loves the Son. And all of that coming 
as a result of our being one. Not that we would be so spectacular that the world will know that the Father sent him. Not that we would be so large. Not that we would be so rich. Not that we would have such great lighting. Not that we would have the best cars. Not that we would have the best clothes, but that we would be one. And as a result of that oneness, the world will know that the Father sent him and the Father loves us. And that felt like a Goliath to me. Because it's like, you want us to do something about that? <laughs> you do realize there's like over 500 denominations, right? Like, what are you trying to do? <laughs> I said, God, if that's what you're trying to do, then that's what you're doing. And let's be a part of it. And I started talking with other people and they were like, uh, don't you think you should start like a parachurch organization to do that? And I felt like, no. God's trying to do this within his church. And then I start seeing strategic puzzle pieces. It's not an accident that we're on the corner of Burton and Kalamazoo, fam. Amen. It's not an accident that we're surrounded by churches. It's not an accident that there are three about to be four Christian organizations that use this building that all have connections to all different churches. It's not an accident that even within those organizations, they too have a burden for unity within the church. God is doing something and strategically placing us, not so that we get glory out of it, but so that we can be an active participant in what the Holy Spirit is doing to answer God, Jesus' prayer. Jesus prayed that the church would be one. Have you noticed that every time we start talking about mission, it always starts with relationships? That's on purpose. Yes, we're called to make disciples, but we ain't called to make disciples by ourselves. The church is called to make disciples. We have a part in that work. Yes, we're called to reach Grand Rapids with the gospel, but not by ourselves. Man, there's way too many people here. And most of them are not even like us. <laughs> That's okay. We're partnered with people who they'll like and encourage one another. What if, our, what if our doctrines aren't the same? Who cares? You love Jesus? Great. Let's go clean up a park in Jesus' name. I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is doing some work within the church to begin lowering down our tribal walls so that we can see our unity. And once we see our unity, then the cousin that won't ever talk about God begins talking about God. Then that spouse that you can't seem to ever to get to pray with you or come to church, then they see something. Then that parent, then that neighbor, then that brother, then that sister. And I know that we want it to be that we wrote the best worship song on the planet and we had the best sermon, but it's not going to be that. It's going to be that the church is united. And then the world will see. It's not a coincidence that our name is Unison. It's not just because we're I'm a musical guy. <laughs> Said from the beginning, harmony is pretty, but unison is powerful. It requires discipline to do unison well. And you've been disciplined. Doesn't mean that we've been perfect. But we're a part of something big happening. And if every year we continue to remind ourselves God did some great stuff so he can do some great stuff through us. God did some big things so he can do some big things 
in us, through us, through us. I mean us. Because this thing goes further than just Sunday morning. It goes further than just salt. It goes further than just man time. It goes further than just the worship team or children's ministry. Your jobs need to be impacted by what God's doing here in us. Your families impacted by what God is doing here in us. All the while, us continuing to point glory to God. So family, God is doing something big. Some of you, that idea of God moving or shaping or shaking things up, it already stirs something inside of you. Some of us are here and we've been walking with the Lord for a minute. But some of us, this is not a thing. We, this is not something that we're used to. We're like, I come to church or I just came today because my child was dancing or whatever. <laughs> we celebrate God doing something big in us. But the truth is, it's the big actually starts within us individually and spreads out as our intimacy with God grows. I feel like we've heard a lot of, we hear a lot of weird promises like you surrender your life to Christ and nothing ever will happen to you. <laughs> You'll always have happy moments. That's not true. Nope. Surrender to Christ and every, th every time you you say that you want to be healed, you'll be healed. That's not true either. That's a lie. It's just not. It's okay. We can be honest about that. What we got to here is from someone who in the last 12 months surrendered to, to Christ. He was sitting over there when I gave the invitation and he rose his hand. I'm going through stuff. But for the first time, I'm not alone going through stuff. Amen. And that's the difference. Yes. For some of us, that doesn't feel spectacular. You just haven't been through enough. <laughs> you ain't been through enough alone yet. <laughs> to know at the pit of your soul that a creator is with you. Yes, delivering you through some stuff, but most of the time, walking with you through it, ensuring that every single day you wake up with peace. That, that is a part of the fullness that Christ offers us. And so, if you're here, and you're going through stuff alone. You're waking up with the anxiety of trying to figure out how to do life by yourself. Going through the day, exhausted, trying to figure out how to do life by yourself. And having a hard time falling asleep. Because... You're all by yourself. I'm inviting you to a relationship with a savior who wants to be with you day in, day out, 24 seven and through every single valley and celebrate with you on the hills too. I will not promise you no valleys because that is contrary to what the Bible says about our life. But the pattern of scripture and the pattern of the life of every believer I've ever known is, is the same. When I'm in my valley, there's more than just two footprints there. There's <laughs> more than just me figuring it out. I have the peace and the wisdom of a creator with me, a savior with me. 
And if that's something that you've not yet experienced, I invite you to the same thing I invited David to. Just put your hand in the air real quick. Sweet. Surrender is a lifetime thing. And those of us who have been walking with Christ, we know surrender doesn't just happen once. Surrender happens moment by moment. But the first step in that is, I've been living my life for me. And now, I want to live for you, God. And so those, I already know that there's one person feeling that. But here's the kicker. We all can participate in surrendering moment by moment. So I want to pray. This is not a moment where you have to repeat after me. That's not how this works. There isn't anything that you'll say that seals the deal. But I do want you to allow your heart, allow the inner part of who you are to do whatever it can to say, God, I give you myself. So, Father, You love us so much, so relentlessly. You love us so much that you give us the heads up that there will be valleys. And you love us so much that you also let us know that you'll be with us there. You love us so much that you say that we can trade our challenges for your burden, which is light. You love us so much that we can come to you with all of our issues and we can petition you, we can pray and leave with peace that we did not come with and that really doesn't make any sense. And so Lord, in this moment, all of us, we surrender. We give you our lives, our thoughts. May they be in alignment with your thoughts. Teach us how to have our thoughts in alignment with your thoughts. Our feelings, may they be in alignment with your feelings, God. Teach us how to have feelings like you do. Teach us how to have your values, God. areas of our lives where we have sinned, made mistakes, made on purposes that hurt people and hurt you, God, we surrender those. And Lord, we confess we are not all together. But receive your mercy on this day. God, I give you myself. And receive your gift of salvation. God, as we surrender together, we want to be a part of the something big you're doing. Continue to guide us. Continue to give us wisdom. Continue to give us discernment, Father. Not so that we get it right, but so that we glorify you. Not so that we're the best, but so that we glorify you. Not so that we're the brightest, but so that we glorify you. Not that we're anything other than people dedicated to giving you glory and making your name famous in the earth. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.